Amen, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to have us here today, all of us. Good to see you. Want to uh, want to say thank you to the church and, and all of the, the kind notes, love, and, uh, and many of you were able to come out and, and brave the circumstances and help us celebrate getting rid of Joe. And uh, wonderful blessing to us yesterday. And uh, uh, we're just uh, grateful for that and all your love and support in that one. Thank uh, Andrew and, uh, and Stephen and Tanya. Uh, we came back, and I hope that none of your skin burns, but we have hosed this place down <laughs> like there is no tomorrow. Uh, that's one of the things afterwards, because we, we did the reception and, uh, or the rehearsal dinner and things like that, and so we have just been like maniacs with, uh, with spraying the place down. So uh, hopefully everybody's going to be okay with that, but uh, uh, we're just, again, thankful for the opportunity to do those things. want to read a thank you. I get a couple of announcements as we begin our service. Um, thank you note from Pastor Lloyd and uh, Francis. Uh, thank you so much for the pastor appreciation. Humbled by your love, encouragement, and generosity. Grateful to be a part of your wonderful people. And that's the way it is. Fantastic. So thank you. Thank you for that one, Pastor, uh, pastor Lloyd. And Francis, give that to the church. I want to point out that out there on the round table in the foyer is your Advent books. Your Advent books are out there. We just unwrapped them out of the plastic. Grab the top one. You should be in pretty good shape. There's hand sanitizer out there on those uh, tables as well. But uh, go ahead and grab your book. Get it in the home. We want every house to have one of these. Every home to have one. So if you know somebody that you're going to see this week that's a shut-in, grab them an extra book. Uh, make sure we get the books out. Make sure if you, there's somebody you're missing, uh, let Sheila know. We went ahead, uh, board, uh, wanted to make sure we put these in your hands yet again. Uh, and make sure you get these out for, uh, for that season. So we, already, we bought the 70. Should be enough for all of our families, all of our homes. Make sure you get one of these, though. Get them in your home. We'll start that devotional. Uh, first part of December right there. Actually, it starts on, I thought it started, and it's out. My speaking has not worked out very well. Um, November 29th is the first Sunday of Advent, so we'll start right there, November 29th. So make sure you got a book, get in your home for the 29th. We'll be going through this very diligently as we look forward to the Advent season. Let Earth Receive Her King, title of the book. And so we're grateful for that, excited for that one. Um, I want to read a verse of scripture uh, for you. We're actually this morning are going to be in 1 Thessalonians, and so I thought it would be appropriate to read from 2 Thessalonians to open up the service. Uh, just kind of the way, kind of the way I am. Well, it really does, and uh, but it's it's one of my favorite uh, passages right here. It's in Second uh, Thessalonians chapter two, beginning in verse thirteen. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. We're encouraged by the word of God this morning. We have been called out and set aside for his purposes. Praise his holy name. Let's pray this morning as we begin our service. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather in your house, to praise your holy name, to desire to be shaped by you, drawn close to you, and Lord, may we all, as we did in Sunday school this morning, ask ourselves the question, is God enough? I pray, Lord, you help us to answer that in the affirmative. And not just with a simple yes, but with a life that demonstrates a passion and desire to serve you always. We love you today. Be in our midst with us, drawing us closer to you while we worship. Find our praise acceptable and worthy in your sight, for it comes from the depths of our love. We love you today and ask now, bless all those watching, all those with us here in person. Watch over us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Not forwarded Randy up there. Awesome. But uh, I want you, if you will, turn to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, again, I can't... Uh, we, we had... Um, it was almost a reprieve from the past few months um, to, to be um, together last night and, and yesterday and uh, folks on other things, always in the back of my mind. Uh, I can't thank um, uh, Larry and Lloyd. It was the first time. That was my first of all the ceremonies I've done where I tag teamed with other pastors. And, uh, and so I appreciate them be, being willing to do that. Uh, Joe, Joe was adamant. He, he didn't have a whole lot to say with the ceremony like many grooms do. But he said, Larry and Lloyd are in there. And I said, well, where, where, son, you got to help me. Where, where are you going to put them at there? And, uh, and really, I, 
again, I, sometimes I don't understand my own kids. I, mean, I raised him, but I don't understand. Um, but he literally, he, he said, I want, I want one to open it and one to close it with prayer. I want him praying over me. And, you know, kids aren't perfect, but my goodness, when they ask for pastors and other godly men in their lives to pray for them, you know, I, Larry and Lloyd understand the, the weightiness of that. And, uh, and I appreciate them and participating. And we didn't have our family, so it was awkward. But we had, uh, we had a lot of our family there. Um, you know, Case is always, she does a great job for the church, but she does an even better job for her family. I don't know if you all know that or not, but we, we, are, we are always blessed by Casey and, and her endeavors for us. You know, she has to take care of a lot of us. We're a handful. But uh, we're, just, we're just so blessed last night. And uh, to be able to add a daughter, and then uh, at the end of the picture, uh, had the largest group of folks I'd married uh, at any one of those things. We had a nice big picture made there. And uh, at the end was our family, our crew. Uh, my boys and their wives, and then, of course, had a little Willow, um, who uh, I looked at the picture, and I thought, wow, what a great picture, and I, I should just crap that off, and I said, well, no, because the one I want's Willow, uh, and so uh, the granddaughter has uh, ran right up the, the flagpole there and gotten ahead of everybody else, but uh, everybody understands that. We talked in Sunday school, however, as an intro to this in First Thessalonians, we talked in Sunday school about Hannah. We're going through couples of the Bible and trying to glean what we can from them and apply it to our lives today. And the question that uh, Hannah's husband asked of her was, am I not enough for you? Remember, Hannah didn't have any children, and uh, and Elkanah's uh, other wife had children and uh, was hard on Hannah, and it wore on her, and it was her desire to have a child. And her husband loved her, and he said, am I not enough for you? And we kind of asked that question that sometimes God asks us, Am I not enough for you? And that's a hard question for us because we begin to list out the things that we have and we desire. But really at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he is enough. We have to understand that the things in our life that complicate that need to be eradicated through prayer and fasting and through, through on our knees before him and humbling ourselves before him and realizing that he is indeed enough for us. And so this morning, as we look here in 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to ask you to stand while we read the word of the Lord this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1 down through verse 11. I'm reading from the ESV this morning. It says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do. But let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let's be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God is not destined to us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless these words, your scripture. Help us to focus on you for just these few moments. Draw us close to you and shape us by renewing that image that is so deeply within Bless us now, your people. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I titled this today, Let's Be Clear. Have you ever tried to want to make things clear to somebody? Try to, try to say, here's what we're going to do. And then they begin to ask questions that aren't related to what you're about to do. Or they ask side questions. Uh, anyone who has children has dealt with that. My father dealt with me in that manner. And I've, I've had to deal with my kids in that way as well. Now, what do you want me to do? I gave Stephen this. Stephen had a task this week for me. He needed to go downstairs into the basement. And he needed to count the studs that are along the wall. And then he needed to count the little yellow 
tabs. We got metal studs down there. So you got to put a yellow tab inside of the frame so it doesn't cut the wires when you pull the wires through the steel studs. And so there are, there's these yellow round discs that go in there, and you can put wire through them. And they're, they're about this big around, and they're yellow. I don't have a lot of yellow things in my basement. And I said, son, go to the bottom of the stairs, count the studs, and then go count to see if we have enough for what we need to do. He said, well, where are the yellow things? I said, well, bottom of the steps, hang a left, shelf on the right, about eye height. Might be some of them in a box right there. One of them is sitting on the shelf all by its lonesome, and you'll see him, and you'll know what the packages hold and contain and look like. I thought that seemed like a pretty good description of what needed to happen. But then there were some questions. Which studs? Well, now, if I just said studs, I would expect all of them. Because there are a couple of rooms that are studded out. I, I need to know all the studs. What's that number? In which shelf? Do, how far down do I walk? It's the first shelf you come to. See, I, I, apparently I wasn't clear enough in the first shelf, so I began to go more and more. Well, a few hours later, as I was counting the studs... Now, I was showing him how, how you, know, you, you, count, you, you stand in a spot so you don't lose sight of line. One, two, three. I always like to count on Sesame Street, you know, and, you know, and, and, and then you know, walk around the corner, and sure enough, there's that one laying by. That's yellow. This is the color yellow. Look at it, hold it, you know. And, and you know, so now we tangibly get a hold of that. We, we, we got through the, the whole task, but apparently I had not been clear enough. And I think sometimes we as Christians, when we talk to the Lord or we read scripture or, or, or we do our Bible study, our devotional, we sometimes start to try to tell God you're not being very clear. When in fact, he is absolutely very clear with what he's saying to us, and we just don't want to hear it because it doesn't match up with how I want to live today. You you see, at the end of the day, I have full confidence in my son with his ability to count. He actually had been there when we put the studs up, so I know he knows what a stud is. So he was a lot like us as Christians sometimes, and deciding he just wasn't going to do that right then. I can use many illustrations for my family, my kids, and I thought I'd talk about him rather than myself with my dad. But the same situation happened back there as well. With my dad, it was nuts and bolts. He'd give you the exact same, go find a nut that fits this. Oh, I love that because we had those big bins of nuts and bolts. It could take him months to dig through all those. You didn't have to do anything else while you go sorting through all those. Have you not found it yet? No. And of course, he'd walk over there and immediately eyeball it. Well, that right there, right there it is. I don't know what you've been doing over here playing with these things, separating them out, playing forward. I don't know what you're doing. Let's go. Got to get back to work. My dad says he ain't got time for this foolishness, right? Those are things. He, are we being clear enough? And I think we sometimes just decide that he's not clear enough. And we blame God for when we ignore him. So let's look at this scripture this morning. Let's take a good look. The day of the Lord. Now, this is, this is about as clear as he can be. Now, I, I like this. The early church was not immune to things that we experience today. They just weren't. There, there, were, there were situations going on that were happening that they were having to write letters to churches about and say, hey, this is not as important as you think it is. He says this. Now concerning, this is verse 1 again. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers... You have no need to have anything written to you. In other words, if they're talking about what what time is it, what season is it, he doesn't have to write to them explaining what's going on in relation to those things. He says in verse 2, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord... Now, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. There is a day coming... When he comes back and he judges everybody for what they've done and whether they've acknowledged him as Lord and Savior, that day is coming. I don't have to write to you about how that day works, how it's going to go down. You understand that there's going to be a day and we won't know when it is and it's going to happen and we best be ready. I don't have to write and tell you to make sure of all those things. You already get that. You're living the life as the church and the body of Christ that you understand that you're living in a manner that tells you you understand one day out of nowhere for those that don't believe in him they're going to be pretty shocked but we as a church we're not going to be shocked we know he's coming back to get us he says look i'm telling you i don't have to write to you about those things for you yourselves are fully aware the day of the lord will come like a thief in the night there are going to be some folks that are going hey man everything is fantastic it's great life is going well whoop why in the world there he is 
my life is over. I'm being judged. My life is over. Now suddenly I realize, man, all them church crazy people talking about Jesus, they was right. He's real. Crazy neighbor living his life for the Lord, not behaving like I do. Sacrificing and giving during this time to make sure their shoe box. I thought they were crazy. Let everybody fend for themselves at this time. And lo and behold, look at what they're doing. I thought they were crazy, but suddenly there he is. See, we, the world doesn't know about it, but we know about it. They're saying they're feeding security, then sudden destruction. Now, this is interesting. I, I went through a few of their translations. This destruction they're talking about here, we think, when, again, when I hear the word destruction, I think of broken things. This destruction here the, is the ultimate destruction. This is what we need to realize. The judgment of God is an ultimate destruction, and the destruction is not a physical destruction we want to think about. It is a full, eternal separation from God. You see, we might think, boy, I sure don't want to tear this up. But I want to tell you, there is coming a day for the world and for us that there will be a separation from God that is not recoverable from. We, we, you know, we hear about folks, we pray about folks who have been in the hospital for 17 days. We, we pray for Sandra while she's been in the hospital and she's going home. I want to tell you, there is no recovery on the day of the Lord when you are separated from him. We as the church need to live our lives not in fear of being in the darkness, though. You see, that's, the, that's what he's saying. I don't have to write about how to handle this. He would do the explanation I just gave you right there. That You see, some folks will get all concerned about the end of things. They'll get concerned about the day of the Lord. And the reason is they know they're not ready for it. On the other hand, there are folks, they want the day of the Lord because they, out of a heart of bitterness, they desire wrath on people that don't agree with them. He says, I don't have to write to you because you understand the role of the church and how we view the day of the Lord. We're going to work every day, so we take as many folks with us. Our job is not the day of the Lord. Our job, he gets that in a few minutes, as, I, as well as I will here in a few moments. But the day of the Lord is that day when he judges. And it says this. It says, there is peace and security. This is verse, uh, verse 3. Sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. There is no one here who has been pregnant for years. You might stretch it out a few extra days. Joe was how many days late, honey? Five days. Five days Joe hung out extra time. But he wasn't going two weeks. He wasn't going three weeks. When a woman experiences labor pains, that baby is going to get here one way or the other. The birthing process will happen one way or the other. And what, the, what he's saying here, he wants to remind us, is, it is a certainty that that's going to happen. We need to understand that today. And he says these folks do. The day of the Lord. Here's what I want to talk to you about for a few moments though. Darkness. He says it will come upon them. But you are not in darkness. Verse 4. You are not in darkness brothers. So all those folks who are confused about the day of the Lord. And what the day of the Lord is supposed to mean to Christians. They live in darkness. But you, church, you good Christian people, you don't live in darkness. Say that with me today. I don't live in darkness. You don't. You do not live in darkness. Why don't you live in darkness? Because you are sons of light. I mean, you got to know, we talk about who you are. We've been talking about, you need to understand very clearly, who are you? Do not let the enemy tell you that you are an instrument of darkness. You are an instrument of light. And beyond that, you are indeed light bearers. The light of God shining through you. You're not living in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are children of light, children of the day. We're not of the night or of the darkness. We're not even of the shade. We are bright beacons of light and life to the world around us because the light itself lives and dwells within us. Man, I love that song, Jerusalem. Now, I had to go through a moment where I didn't like it because it was sung at mom's funeral and all, but I'm getting past it a little bit. Nothing like a pandemic to redraw you back to songs you like. The Lamb of God must be the light. Is one of those phrases in that song. I want to tell you today, the Lamb of God, the light of the world, lives within each of you. I don't care what the enemy says. I'm looking across this beautiful congregation this morning. I look at each and every one of you. If you're actually walking in darkness, you've done a pretty good job of fooling your pastor. 
I want to tell you, you are an instrument of light. You are a child of light. You belong to God today. And your call on your life is to realize, I don't walk in darkness. I am light to the world and those around me. I am light in love and life because it is he who lives within me, the Savior of the world. That is who we are. So today I want you to realize this. You are not darkness And he's telling the Thessalonians that today. You see, that's what they needed to hear. He says, look, you don't have to worry about how that day the Lord goes down. You want to know why? You're already living your eternity. You're starting it here on earth. He dwells within you, and that's going to last forever and forever and forever. And you will not be destroyed on the day of the Lord. I'm telling you. That's pretty good preaching there, preacher. (laughs) You see, we get confused down here, though, because brace yourself. The reason he can talk about darkness is this world is filled with darkness. Make no bones about it. This is a dark and evil world that we live in today. It's all around us. Everywhere you look, there is darkness. And it shouldn't frighten us. It should make us even more bright. Let me put it this way. You got a flashlight in your hand. Go into that dark basement. Which works better? Flailing your arm around and screaming and yelling for the darkness to get away from you? Or hitting that button? Hitting the button. I don't know who puzzled looks, but hit the button is why you do it. Turn the light on. Be light in that darkness. You are a lamp. You, 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 don't, you don't hide the lamp under a bushel. You, you put it out in the open where people can see the light. We are that light in the darkness. So when you see evil and hatred and bitterness and all the things we know are absolutely wrong and there's no question about it in this world, we are to be the opposite. That's our call is light. Our call is carrying Jesus in this world, is to carry light into this world. And when people have no hope, we're hope. And when I say that, I want to mean, I want to mean like this. When there's somebody who says, I do not know where I'm going to turn to next. I, don't, I need a helping hand. I don't know where I'm going to go. That's why churches and local communities are so important. Sometimes, Sheila, I'm going to call her out a minute ago. We are such a beacon in this community that Sheila's like, there are so many requests for help. And there are more requests than we can actually meet in this community as this little church. But here's what I want you to understand. You can look around here. You can see how many are watching online, however you want to do it. Look around here, and I want to tell you, we probably receive almost as many calls as there are people in this room every single week. The reason we do it is because they know we are a beacon of hope. The community said, hey, I tell you what, go down there to that Nazarene church. They'll do whatever they can. They might not be able to cure all your problems and help everything, but they'll, hey, they'll, they'll help. If they can help, they're going to help. That's who we are in this little community that we live in. That's who we have got to be in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our families, to know that we can be come and called upon to pray or to give or to come alongside people that are in need and they're desperate, they have no hope, and we offer them hope. We offer them friendship. We offer them love and light. We don't just scream at the darkness. We live a light that drives it out. That's probably the next sign. We are light. I always do that. I apologize. Leave that up there for just a minute. We are all children. Verse 5. We are all children of light. Children of the day. We are not of the night. So let us then. Look at that verse 6. So let us then not sleep as others do. But let us keep awake and be sober. Sober-minded. I know he mentions you know, those that are drunk or drunk at night. But this sober mind, this sober word here is a sober-minded type word. Paying attention, being aware. Being aware is what we're supposed to be. We should be aware of what all is going on in the world around us. We should be aware of the turmoil in people's lives. But I want to tell you, we as beacons of light, as the church and the body of Christ... We need to be aware of what's around us. 
Darkness is all around us. Darkness is all throughout the lands. But there's also darkness around us. You have experienced darkness. You've, you've either experienced the enemy just attacking you with darkness, or you've experienced your neighbor or your friend or a loved one dealing with some things. We drive that out that's right around us. I, I know there's all kinds of opportunities to serve. We're giving shoeboxes that are going to go all around the world. But did you know there are needy people right here in our community? Well, of course you do. It's why every year we help families out at Christmas time who don't have the means locally. We don't say in this church, well, look, we did shoeboxes for kids all around the globe, so we got nothing left for here locally. That's not the way this church works. We make sure that we're able to meet needs locally as well because there is darkness around us and people who need hope around us. They need love. You know somebody today who feels unloved by this world. You probably know somebody who feels unloved by the church. Help us. It's our job as light bearers, true light bearers, to help them. Help those who've been hurt. Help those who need to know him. I've got to feel the same slide, faith and love. That's what he speaks of here, verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. You've heard this language before, the armor of God. Let us put on faith and love. When we go to battle, we go to battle with our faith in God and the love of God flowing through us. Now, I want to tell you, I've been, I've been in a fight before, a physical fight. Thankfully, not in recent times. I, I, I've, I, I've been kicked so hard while on the ground that I stood up. boy should have played kicker in high school but he didn't i want i've been in those i want to take something a little more than faith and love into a fist fight but god is telling us look church here's what you take for because it is stronger and mightier than anything the enemy throws at you your faith in me your absolute faith and trust in me and my love flowing through you There have been dark times in my personal life. There have been things in my family we really don't talk about still. Because one, they're not necessary. But I will tell you this. There were moments that it was so dark in our lives that a mother holding us and squeezing us and saying, I love you. It was so dark and it was so heavy. And the enemy had such a control. The only words that would penetrate and the only words that offered hope wasn't an explanation, wasn't how we're going to get help, but it was a loving mother wrapping her arms around saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And it didn't matter what words came out of our mouths, they were answered with, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I want to tell you today, that's what God has done for each and every one of us. While we spew hatred and we yell at him and we blame him for our lot in life and we tell him all the things that are going wrong because he's not enough and he's not God enough right now and where is he gone? And I want to tell you today, God is calling out from an old rugged cross, I love you. I've done all I can do. I love you. I love you until we get that through our thick skulls and realize that God's love is a love that transforms us into carriers of his love that doesn't make sense to the world we go to war with his love flowing through us but it doesn't end there with his love flowing through us it says this well a lot of tears blink those out Wipe them out. What are we going to do? The breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. The hope we offer is that when that day of the Lord comes, it's all good. When the day of the Lord comes, we're all right. When he returns... We're okay. When we breathe our last, it's okay. When we breathe our last, we no longer have regrets. We no longer have doubts. We no longer have the fears in our life. For we are his and his eternally. 
the hope of salvation. It's what we offer up to the world around us, that living hope, that living hope that we offer. Why do we do that? Why do we live where we understand that the darkness is a darkness? The day of the Lord's going to happen. We're not afraid of that. Why do we live our lives in such a manner that we can walk out and arm ourselves with faith and love and hope? And that's what we carry into the battles against the darkness of this world. It's because the light of the world is Jesus Christ who lives within us. And what did he do? He loved us so much that he humbled himself before his heavenly father. Humbled himself even unto death on an old rugged cross that we might be saved. And he has filled us with his spirit that we might do the same to those around us. That when we get to glory, there are so many people there. Not for our honor, but for his glory, for his honor. And so many that saw that he loved them so much. That's why he does this for us. You see, this is the truth of the matter. For God, look at this, verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath. One more time. But God has not destined us for wrath. It's not God's plan for us, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we might live with him. I want to tell you, we're bearers of light, but not that, but God has a plan for your life. And what is that life? What is that plan he has for us? That we shouldn't be concerning ourselves with the wrath of God, but concerning ourselves with the salvation that came through Jesus Christ, our Savior. When it gets hard on our lives, when the darkness presses in, we cling to that light that gave himself for us. The light that lives within us. And we cling to that. We focus on that. When the world gets tough, when pressures of life mount upon us, when we don't know where to turn, we turn back to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we go back to that moment where we realize that he indeed died for us. And he's called us to live a life in that manner. We go back to that, folks. That's where we live each and every day. In the midst of no matter what comes our way, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's cold or flu season, whether it's summertime, whether it's hunting season, whether it's f- fishing season is year-round, ain't it? You can fish year-round pretty much. I heard of ice fishing, right? If not down here. If you're of ice fishing in Alabama, we got different troubles. I want to say it doesn't matter what season of life you're in, doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, here's the call of God. It's that you should know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. That is the call upon your life, and then you live a life that shines light to everybody, that encourages others to draw closer to Him, that encourages others to know Him as Lord and Savior. That now becomes your life, and it doesn't make sense to the world. Your primary focus is no longer building up your retirement accounts, making sure you're financially secure, making sure your loved ones continue to live better than the vast majority of the people walking the face of this earth. Your call and your concern is about the very souls of your family and your neighbors. That's what we talked about in Sunday school this morning. Realizing that the eternal souls of our children, our spouses, our grandkids, our friends... You and this church, those are the most important things to us. And how do we accomplish that? Look at verse verse 11. It says that, therefore, therefore, because of all that, because you're not living in darkness, because you don't fear the day of the Lord, because you are children of light, and you walk around with this crazy notion of faith, love, and hope being all you need to go out into the world with. Because you're those things, because you know all those things, because you know he is your savior. Therefore, all of that, hey, here's you go, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you were doing. What was the church at Thessalonica doing? They were encouraging one another. They were seeing somebody in need in the church. They, hey, man, let me encourage you, man. It's going to be all right. I know you're going through a tough time. It's going to be all right. Hey, I'm praying for you. We're going to get through this because I'm, I'm with you. We're being the very embodiment of God around us. Hey, I know it's rough. I know it's, I know it's difficult. I know this year hadn't been easy. I didn't know what to expect. My last year was terrible. I thought this year would be better. Huh? I, I don't know what to tell you, but here it is. Here's the truth of the matter. 2019? 2020? Same God. 
Let me go back before the bad year of 2019 for me personally and go back in 2018. Guess what? Same God. Same God. Go back as far as you want to go. Poor old Tanya. I told Sunday school this morning. I don't, the one part she does not like about me doing weddings. She knows at some point in the next 24 hours, I'm going to make sure she hears it out of my mouth. You understand. She heard it this morning from me. You understand. I look at you the same way Joe looked at Savannah or whoever, who happened to be getting married that day. I look at you the very same way I did on our wedding day. That's almost 30 years ago. Now she, pff, yeah, yeah, right? She, you know, she does that for me, but that's, that's who we are. That's who we are. But she knows. She knows at some point of that. Well, let me tell you, just like my love for her hadn't changed, it's that same God. Is still on the throne today. That same God. And it goes beyond that. The same God that parted that Red Sea. And they walked through on dry land. It is that same God that lives within you. So I want to tell you. You are children of light. Therefore quit living like the world. And worrying about the things of the world. And realize that eternity is guaranteed for you. And take as many with you as you can. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. Get them off this world. This world will distract and destroy your soul. It will rob you of everything. And so church, let me encourage you today. Be reminded of who you are. Realize he is king of kings, lord of lords. And the reason why we walk around like that is we know the day of the Lord is real. And we are assured of it. We don't have to worry. Therefore. Therefore, I've said it before, I know it's hard. This Advent season is going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. Where the whole church gets our devotionals and we focus on God and God alone. And we rejoice in knowing that once a year we can join in and be reminded that it should be every day of our lives. We rejoice that the Savior came and walked among us. You see, because then we get, an advent, we get all excited. Whoa, he came there. He walked among us. He dwelt among us. And we all started getting ready for Easter because we remember what happened at Easter. Easter, he died for my sins. And I rejoice that I am free from the bonds and the chains of sin because of what he did on the cross. And then I got 40 more days. 40 more days. It's a reminder that every day I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. The fire of God fell upon me, dwells within my soul, and I'll never be the same again. And I'm not going back to being worried about what man says. I got nowhere else to go and I got nothing left with God. And so here I go again. And that's what Advent's getting me warmed up for. You want to tell me why? I'm getting some more boisterous about this because it's simply this. The world's getting louder and louder in your ears. The world wants to destroy you. It does, Willow. I don't know if that's a scared cry or what. I told Tanya today, or not, it was this past week, I told her, oh, I found it. Joe lost this last night. No, no, it wasn't a ring. It was the pin that held the dangly thing on. Um, well, whatever. I told her this week, and this is the problem. I don't call it a problem, though, anymore. Here's the deal. My love for you this week, Tanya had to listen to me kind of get off the rails a little bit. And I had to tell tell Tanya, I had to say it out loud so I could work through it. But here's the fact of the matter. I know how hard a year it's been. I know how hard it's been on me. I know how hard it's been on you. And I told her, I said, I know. I am not Jesus. But if I could take it all away from them, I'd give everything up. I'd give my very life. If I could help my church out, if I could help my friends out, my family out, if I could ease their, their troubled minds, if I could ease their souls one iota, I would. The moment I got that out of my mouth, though, the moment I spoke it out of my mouth, Jesus reminded me of that illustration I gave you. And he says, you don't have to say that because I've already done it. I've already died for him. I already gave him everything. What more can he say than to you he hath done? I want to tell you, church, there's freedom from this world. And it's found in just clinging tighter and tighter to Christ Jesus. 
So let me encourage you. Therefore, get the enemy off your back. Get the enemy out of your life and cling to Christ Jesus, for he is faithful. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, I hope it was clear to your people that you love them. I hope it's clear that we belong to you and we should not fear. I hope it's clear that we should live our lives as lives of encouragement. You see, all those things stem from this one absolute truth. I hope it's clear that we know you as Lord and Savior. If we do that, everything else is all right. Everything else works out. Help us to cling tight to our Savior today. I pray, Lord, for every family represented, whether they're watching online or whether they're gathered here in our sanctuary. I pray, Heavenly Father, right now that you would help them. Help each individual realize that this isn't complicated. We just got to lean into you. One step in front of the other. Loving as you, having our faith in you. Placing all our hope in you. Lord, I pray. Pray, Lord, that there's one who doesn't understand. There's one who doesn't know. I pray, God, you help them. Lord, you got to help each of us with this. Lord, as I said, this week I had to walk through this again. So I pray, Lord, you help each of us. I pray, Lord, you remind us of who you are. Lord, bless our families. Bless each one here. Bless that good group of boys and girls next door. Give us opportunity to be yours to be light bearers in this world, to realize we just need to let that light shine. Help us today to be yours and yours alone. And we will give you the praise, the honor and the glory for you're the only one worthy. Watch over us now in Jesus' wonderful, matchless name. We ask all these things and can all God's people say it together. Amen Amen. and amen. God bless you. Remember, God loves you and so do we. Take care. We'll see you this evening. Board meeting at 4 o'clock in Holt Hall. See you there.